<coughs> it's not counting or anything. I think it's. Oh, yeah, it says REC. There we go. Okay. Well, um, thank you for uh, coming. The, the officially called this meeting to order uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, I do not recognize everybody. There's some new, some somewhat newer faces. So let's go around the table real quick and, and introduce everybody. Let me start. Uh, Robert Moore. I live in Orem. I'm an attorney. I'm in the county attorney's office. Um, I've only been on this, I think, since last year a little bit, maybe. So, newer. I'm Reed Price. I'm the assistant public works director. Brent Tubler, just a firm resident. Maybe coming up on the year now. So, uh, Mike Wimpy, I'm a civil engineer, work for Central Utah Water Conservancy District, and been on the committee for about a month or two. Gary Morley, just a forum guy. I'm Cody Stable, street sex manager for Orem. Jeanette Buxton, streets uh, GIS specialist. And Todd Hadley, uh, I am uh, the Chair. chair. Well, I'm not the chair. I'm the vice chair. Oh, yeah, that's vice right. Vice chair. Yes. And Let's go over. Oh, what was the other day? I'm Thane Carter. I'm the fleet manager. Uh, Giles Dempy, water reclamation section manager. Tyler Pay. I'm the public services division manager. Rick Sadie, storm water section manager. And Jim Moore, park section manager. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I guess our first order of business is to uh, consider uh, approval of the uh, meetings from uh, uh, minutes from last year's uh, la last the last meeting. So, so moved. Okay. Second. Okay. All those uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes. Okay, and uh, I guess we'll uh, turn the time over to Cody and Jet. Okay. Uh, again, we're we're this we're the street section here, so we're gonna uh, walk you through what the street section does here at Public Works. Um, feel free to ask questions. We're, we're gonna bounce back and forth between the two of us to kind of go through some of this. So. Um, start off, just like to show you a bunch of faces of our group. This is these are the this is our staff that uh, works and does your snow removal, does your uh, the roads and the sidewalks. So, so we'd share that picture with you. Um, Press, you found a moment to get them all off the snow plows this, this year. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> I think it actually snowed that day too. So, um, okay. What our section uh, consists of is, of course, me, the section manager. We have a field supervisor, um, two crew leaders on asphalt. When we get busy in the summer, we can split into two different crews. Um, we have four other technicians on that crew, plus we hire a bunch of uh, seasonal help, up to eight, eight to ten. Um, on the concrete crew, we have a crew leader and three operators that, that uh, repair sidewalk, and we had a couple seasonals there as well. And then again, we have the GIS specialist position uh, in charge of pavement and sidewalk management. Um, Orms Roadway Summary. So the city currently owns and maintains about 240 center line miles. I think that number is just a little bit more than that, maybe like 242. But um, and 536 lane miles. Difference between the two, of course, is the center of the road compared to the different lanes that are traveled widths. You were mentioning <coughs> widths just a minute ago. Uh, so you got different lanes. So, Cody, that, that means that just down the center, if you have a really wide road, you're still just counting the center of that. And yeah, if you have so a real narrow road, it's just the center. And then the lot, the lane mile. Did you have uh, five? So 536 is if you measured each lane that right, would travel Right. Correct. Down. So like this road that's on the screen would be three lanes. 
we don't we're not counting the bike lane that's kind of a newer thing and then a subdivision road that'd be two lanes back and forth um, different cities count different ways because when you're doing snow removal it's more of a lane mile type thing than, than a center line mile when we're doing pavement management we're looking at set, uh, center line miles um, there's also plus or minus 500 miles of, of concrete sidewalk uh, we've counted about 4,600 ADA ramps and the corners that are that have the yellow tiles and just yeah the, cor the corner ramps. Um, total square footage of the, the street is about 48.5 million square feet. Excuse me. The estimated value of the city streets is approximately 206 million dollars. That's based off of uh, the current rate at four dollars and 25 cents per square feet, meaning if you were to go out and just replace the asphalt and the road base not the sub base not the utilities not hardware not concrete or anything like that it's just asphalt and road base so you can see that the the city streets are quite an asset quite quite a, an expensive expensive asset for the city um, street sections primary responsibilities what are they basically maintaining a pavement management program and that includes sidewalk management in there as well um, asphalt maintenance just you know, we're going to talk about all these things concrete maintenance and snow removal operations so what is pavement management I'm going to let Jet take over real quick here because he's in charge of that this is my bread and butter if I didn't know what this was then I shouldn't be here <laughs> so pavement management so we'll go through a little bit of what pay pavement management is and what that means um, every city and system manages <coughs> pavement differently and we have our own way of doing it but there are some standards that have been set that kind of make it easy to follow so I'm just gonna read this off the screen for for this one because it's a really good description that's in our state of the streets report a pavement management program refers to individuals, computer software, and available resources working together to determine, recommend, and implement the most cost-effective course of action concerning maintenance and repair of the city's street system. Inspections, analysis, testing, performance, and experience can help determine when to apply needed maintenance or repair to the right street at the right time in a fiscally responsible manner. And I think the biggest thing there is what, what a lot of people um, find is unique about our system is the experience aspect of things. We have a lot of really good systems. We have a lot of people that are really knowledgeable about the street system. Cody's been here a long time and he's imparted a lot of his knowledge about the street system and how our roads personally perform using our strategies. And it's really useful information to kind of pass, pass on to future generations in these positions. So I think that's a really unique part of our program. But I'll talk about some of the tools we have. I just called myself a tool. I apologize. <laughs> but this is uh, one of the biggest um, helps that came to streets, I believe. But tooting my own horn here. Um, uh, this position really maintains a lot of this pavement management program and keeps things up and running, keeps inspections up to date so that we have uh, everything correct. We have an asset management program that's tied to our GIS data, our mapping data. It's called Elements Access allows us to track our work orders and uh, various other things and we're trying to advance that over time. We use Esri mapping software uh, which is pretty standard in a lot of places now and we have a lot of tools through that enterprise suite. Uh, we have our crews. Our crews are really important and they help us maintain that those ratings on our roads. If we have a small area that can bring the rating of a road up, we take care of it if we can. And one of us, another small one is something that I do is core drilling. It's a way for us to check the road and check what's underneath. So um, what I do is I go out and I'll core a road at a certain interval to be able to see how thick it is, how it's performing underneath the surface. Um, and uh, I did get a video of that if anyone's interested to see what that is. <laughs> oh, where's the mouse? Looks like it's hiding over there. Go ahead and show that. Nope, well, looks like we're going to skip that today. Sorry, everybody. And more, of course. There's so many other things. But we'll talk about kind of how we rate our roads. So our roadway ratings, we use a system called um, OCI, or Overall Condition Index, which, uh, which coincides with our OCR rating, which is basically just a simpler way to break that up. Um, if you've heard PCI, it's very similar. 
The only difference is that it takes into account the, uh, the ride of a road as well as the actual physical condition. Uh, a lot of citizens will be uh, curious about, well, they'll, you'll notice the ride before how it looks. So we do take that into account. Um, but our ratings span from excellent down to failed, and we strive to have no failed roads, and we haven't had one in quite a while. So, And part of this program is keeping us from having any failed roads. Uh, our current rating is uh, hovering around 82, 83, but that does fluctuate as inspections proceed and a road project happens and our ratings go up. How would you think that compares to other communities? I know we don't know what their rating is, but as you've driven through other communities in our area, or, or, or is an 83 good? Because you hear B and you, know, you want your kids to, to get A's, <laughs> is an A feasible? If you look at uh, the score of our infrastructure in the U.S., uh, our roadway systems definitely need some improvement. I don't remember what it is. You said you're a civil engineer. Do you happen to remember what our score for roads is with, on the ASCE uh, ratings? I think it's a D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if it I'm, a I believe it's a D. And yeah. so knowing that our roads hover around that 80%, is pretty positive. In fact, what I've seen even in uh, Colorado, because we just went to, um, to uh, goodness, UAPA, and Colorado's ratings can span from around 40s up to 70s, and it's nice to see that we're really maintaining a really great pavement, manage pro pavement management program. So I know that that's as I drive through Orem and in other communities, it's, it's noticeably different. Much smoother. Not that we're perfect, so a B seems about right. Yeah. Not if you've driven down 1600 North Lake. I mean, that's, well, that's, that's <laughs> this winter's been a bad one. one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll actually talk about that a little bit. So okay, good. So can I yeah. ask questions? Then sure. tell us the difference between an excellent, the good, and the fair, the poor. It, I mean, what what is really going to look? What's the road going to look like? It's different okay. between those. Just that, that kind of a little bit. Just a taste. That's an excellent question, and the best way I can put it is 100% is a road that we just overlaid or reconstructed. It's asphalt that has no cracking, no oxidation, no, no, uh, no, none of the aggregate separating from the surface, and so the binder and everything is folding together nicely, and the road is not having any water infiltration. Water is the, it is the enemy of roads. It's what causes potholes. It's what causes everything. And then the next enemy is sun, but sun is something harder to maintain. That's why we put surface treatments, which we will actually dive into what surface treatments we do and what they do to help. Um, but a, a failed road is a road that's just, it's just falling apart. I mean, it's a road that no one should be driving on, that you know is breaking apart, has loose pieces. And that's not something we really see as much here in Orem. We do have potholes. We do have roads that are worse, but we don't have roads that you, know, you might be tilting back and forth on it as you're driving across it because it no longer has a structure. But Cody might actually be able to speak to that a little better if you have a different yeah, perspective I kind of wish on we it. would have had some pictures. Um, yeah, yeah, that would have been great. Yeah, like he's saying, for our condition rating, I, I believe, is 100 to 90 for excellent, somewhere around there, 90 to, what is it, 70? I believe it's a, sorry, I should have actually had this in the yeah. presentation. I believe it's um, a 90 down to, a, to an 80 on good. Yeah, so, the, so go ahead. The picture you got there on the road, what would you put that one? That one right there would probably be in the high 70s, high 70s, low 80s. It's generally started to oxidize, started to crack. Our first attempt to, to do any type of maintenance would be crack sill to sill cracks. So that would be a, a pretty high, pretty good road, really. Um, it's good, Like I said, it's got some oxidation on it. Uh, our first method would probably be slurry. We'll get into that just because of the surface of it. But yeah, it's generally generally a pretty good road, got a good crown, drainage, that kind of thing. Uh, Cody, when you say it's got some oxidation, what are you seeing in that picture? So if you, you know, asphalt new is black, right? And so when uh, when it's made, it, the asphalt it, oil coats rocks, and so when that oil starts to come off the rocks and the rocks start to polish, you start to leave some of the fines out of the top of the surface, that's what we call oxidation, it turns gray. Um, starts to oxidize, and it's all due to the sun and, and rain and water, I should say. But, um, it's just that it's starting to ravel a little bit, that kind of thing. So that road right there, where is it in this life cycle? 
I mean, I, you could probably figure what, 20 years, 25 years? How many, how many years you put on the road? Well, <laughs> it, it's a little different. So the national uh, roads are built to 20 years nationally. In Orem, when we first started this pavement management program back in the early 2000s, we found some of our roads to be 50 years old. And so our life cycle curve it changes. It goes up to, I believe, 33 years as a local subdivision road. And it, and it goes down from there. Like a, like Center Street would have a different life cycle, more like a 20-year, 20 25-year life cycle compared to a, a local road. So we, we do break them up a little bit. This would be about... He's going to show a curb here in a minute that, yep. that, that's going to show that whole 100 to 0 kind of thing. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll get to that and I'll okay. point that out. Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you. I'm going to jump into the sidewalk ratings. This is a bit simpler. So our sidewalk ratings is really, you know, you get to a certain point with a sidewalk and it needs to be replaced or some kind, have some kind of mediation. But what we do is we place points on the map and we rate them either high, moderate, low, and recently, we've decided to uh, now start tracking trip hazards that are being reported. So trip hazards, we have a program that does cut those, and we'll, we'll dive into that as well. We have milling machines. So the idea is that if we see those, we will get a whole street milled so that it can all meet code and be safe. But if somebody reports one, we want to make sure that it is tracked so that we are aware that that has been uh, called in. So, but the main thing is that a high would be something that's, it's a hazard, it's falling apart, it's cracking, <laughs> there's big lips that might cause someone to trip, or the whole thing is just breaking apart. Moderate is something that's, it, it, I mean, the, the name kind of speaks for itself, it's a moderate hazard uh, and a bit easier to fix, um, and probably getting closer to really needing to come out. And a low is something that we're just keeping an eye on, something that could get worse. Road projects and surface treatments. We'll dive into that question. We'll talk about where our funding comes from. Uh, Cody, do you want to speak to this one, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah. We all know that we pay a gas tax, right? That's the BNC road funds. That's our biggest, our biggest pool of money that we get. Um, within the last few years, they've implemented here in Utah County a local sales tax tax option. That's what it's called, right? Reed. Reed was like that was a lot about that. Um, it's our second biggest funding source, and of course, we have a little bit of funding through the general fund. Not much, it's more for just uh, um, some materials and, and things like that, but we don't we don't base big road projects off the general fund. Everything comes off of the BNC and the local sales tax option. Yeah, several years ago when we just had the BNC road fund source, we had just enough money to maintain the roads, to, to, to put surface treatments on them, but nothing to really dive into it, really do some overlays where they were so the legislature created the local option sales tax, which was controversial at the time because a portion of it was supposed to go to UTA. Um, ultimately, this, uh, the, well, the, the, the community voted it down um, when, it was, when it was put to a vote. The legislature changed it to where the Utah County Commission uh, could approve it, and ultimately that's what they did. But that was that was needed. Uh, we did not have enough money to maintain our, our roads in the long term um, without that. We were looking to do a transportation utility fee uh, on residents in Orem, and then when they did this local option sales tax, it, it, it almost doubled what we were able to spend on our roads, which, which was, it was, it was needed. I think Commission's considering a fit quarter now. Are they? For transportation? Yeah. Okay. It's the new quarter. That's what it has to do by July 1st. Thanks for that context, Reed. Yeah. Appreciate it. And here's that chart we are going to talk about. So this is just a kind of a representation of, of data that has been shown with roads throughout the U.S. I, this, this kind of follows a lot of standards you'll see in, in, uh, in a lot of roads. It does depend on the type of community, the type of weather. Of course, different states are going to have different standards. But uh, you can see the red line uh, that comes all the way up from 100. You can see how a road will degrade over time. And, you know, sometimes even with no treatment, a road can still outperform what it typically should. Um, but let's assume between 20 and 30 years that road would perform. If it's a local road, it might last a little longer. 
But you can see this green line here, you can see that as you do periodic maintenance, say you throw a slurry on it every 12, 15 years, just as you start noticing it getting bad, you can see that, that road will perform better. It'll stay alive longer. <coughs> but if you do what we're doing and you do consistent maintenance, where you're cutting out bad spots where you need to, then putting a crack seal on it consistently every eight years, eight, seven years as we're doing, and slurry <coughs> just as often on those local roads, microsurfaces on those bigger roads, making sure you do all that consistent maintenance that's necessary, you can keep that road working and alive for a long, long time, which is what we've seen with our roads and why we have uh, surprisingly long-lasting roads in such a good rating. I like to... I like to um to, to use an analogy of, of uh, uh, hand cream on your on your hands to get them all nice and soft. And uh, when you do slurry seals, you go you, you do a crack seal first, and then you put a, a layer of, of like a tar and aggregate, or I don't exactly know what it is, but um, that, that's the slurry seal where your your road looks pretty much brand brand new, not brand new, but really nice, and if we do that every seven to eight years, then you can see that the, the OCI uh, gets a bump um, each time it does that. Ultimately, it's, it's never going to get back to 100, so at some point there needs to be an overlay where they're, they're putting a new surface on the road, um, but you can see that it drastically improves things and it's a lot cheaper to maintain it uh, with those slurry seals than it is to uh, to to repair failed roads and uh, you know, failed roads uh, you'll probably get to the cost of, of slurry seals are cheap compared to failed roads yeah in fact this line actually shows if you look at these critical zones you can actually think of that as those are those are price points it costs far less to maintain a road that's between 100 and say 80. But as soon as that dips, you can actually you can actually consider the price as also an exponential curve that goes up, because as you saw, the cost of our roads per square foot is about 4.25 for a full reconstruct. But a slurry, for example, and, and like you said, we'll dive into this a bit more. It's about I think the most recent bid we got was 15 cents a square foot. And so to keep a road alive for another 10 years and keeping the water out, you put, a, you put a crack seal on, which is even cheaper than that, and you've saved so much money. But there comes a point when you can't do those treatments anymore. So you have to keep them above that critical zone so that you can continue to do the lighter treatments and save money. Otherwise, you'll be just hemorrhaging funds trying to keep these roads working so that people aren't damaging their vehicles and you know the road is still smooth and looks good. I have to jump in here real quick. Just like Reed said earlier <clears throat> um, about the, the funding for BNC when, before we had the local sales tax option, um, we really implemented a slurry seal program, and you've probably seen it in your neighborhood. It's come through every six to eight years. That really saved us. It, it's, not, it's not the nicest thing. It's not a brand-new street. It's not that, but it really saved us through them years to be able to maintain our streets up to a, a certain level without that funding. With the new funding, we're, we're looking at being able to get into these subdivisions and, and do some more overlays within the neighborhoods. So. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to talk about what those treatments are. So our biggest projects, in the end, you still have roads that need to be redone. Sometimes utility projects come through. Sometimes you have a crazy winter like we just had, and sometimes a road just needs to be redone. And so... Um, the biggest uh, intervention that we can do is a full reconstruct at full depth. You're pulling the base out, you're pulling the asphalt out, and you're probably building it back a bit thicker. Um, but a partial depth would be just be the asphalt. And there's many cases where we have fantastic base still under those roads, and you can just put it right back as is. That's because we, had, we found when we had 50-plus year roads, we had good base under them. It might, might have been, it was more because the asphalt was really thin but the base was great, and there's a, there's a lot of roads. If you remember Geneva Rock and, and the, the slag that, we can still get slag down there, but there's many roads here in Orm that are built on slag, which basically turns to like a concrete. It, it, it's hard stuff, so kind of make, makes them roads last longer. 
then the next one is a mill and overlay. We do that most often for these road projects. We'll have a lot of roads come in for a mill and overlay. A local road would get about a, um, an inch and a half uh, mill and overlay, uh, but a uh, main collector arterial road would have a two inch. And so we'll, a mill and overlay is you take a big machine that goes, scrapes off the top two inches, and then you come and put it right back down. So exactly. We either do a profile or an edge mill, and an edge mill is usually just getting those those kind of, I guess you can call them kind of the mushroomed edges whenever you start getting layers and layers and layers on there after doing a lot of surface treatments. So edge mill is the most common, but profile mill, if we need to fix the profile of that road, we'll mill a little bit more off so we don't have to build up as much of a crown, we just create the crown. So with well, the yeah, and a lot of roads are flat here in Orem, and so like he says, our edge milling is more common, and that's also to get that shape, to get that crown without taking too much up top. So mm -hmm. if we can mill down the edges and put a two inch, one and a, one and a half inch over, you get, you get that crown built back up too. The next one, our saving grace, the surface treatments, the things that keep us alive. Uh, I'll talk about the most, um, the uh, biggest ones first, down to the, uh, the smallest ones. So I will actually jump to the bottom, actually. Let me correct myself. Crack seal is something that we will do before all three of these. So if you put, if you put a blanket over the problem, you still have cracks, and that blanket's going to seep into those cracks and you have cracks again. So crack seal is really important that we do them before each of these projects. So you can basically make sure those cracks are gone, and then put your blanket over it. Because your blanket would be your slurry or your microsurface or your seal coat. And you can see that each of these is used for different areas. We've opted to use microsurface, uh, a microsurface project for our main arterials and collectors. So our bigger roads. It's harder, it's stronger, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's only 33 cents in our last bid per square foot, which is still a heck of a deal. Slurry seal projects, as I said, 15 cents per square foot. Those are for our local roads, and sometimes those will go on a collector and arterial if we haven't overlaid them. Generally, in a, uh, a microsurface will perform better on a, fresh, on a road that has been overlaid and has new asphalt on top of it, or at least it's been, uh, it meets the current standards for asphalt. Seal coats, we have opted to use that only for parking lots. Uh, we've talked about maybe having that as being as, uh, be as an option for local roads, but we've seen that the current way that we uh, handle it perform the best. And then we have other projects. Um, we recently started uh, a cycle that we want to we want to get on to pr to prep for our big roadway project, where we do a concrete project, which would tackle ADA ramps on those roads that are out of date, and then just generally <laughs> fixing broken sidewalk on those same roads. If you have a brand new looking good road, you probably want good looking concrete on the same road. So we're trying to keep up with that. So um, this is our first year doing a, a large scale one, I believe. And to jump in here too, uh, anything that's microsurface, the, the mill and overlay and the full reconstruct, we're required to, uh, to upgrade the ADA ramps on the corners. Um, on a slurry sill, that kind of thing, we're not required. So doing the concrete project along um, yeah, there's a lot of ramps that still need to be upgraded every time you do that, so a lot of extra work. If you ever get an opportunity to, to drive out and look at something, you can actually drive uh, 12 South, which is going to be overlaid this year. You can see there's a lot of concrete work happening, and that's actually this project. So uh, if you want, want to kind of see what's going on with that, just give 12 South a drive. And then Trip Hazard Mitigation Project. This is our big project that's trying to cycle through the whole city to get all of our larger trip hazards taken care of. We have a, a great company doing it for us right now, uh, Precision Concrete Cutting, and they actually use a, a grinder rather than a milling machine, and they get nice, clean cuts. And so they've been doing a fantastic job. And we're trying to make it through the whole city so we can get the majority of them tackled, and then hopefully we'll be able to cycle back through and get the smaller stuff. But in the meantime, we're maintaining the smaller stuff as, as needed. Okay. That's our first section, <laughs> but we've got more. We can talk about our crews now, um, what kind of stuff they do. Um, like I said, the asphalt crew has six full-time members, uh, two crew leaders, four technicians, and we do anywhere from six to ten seasonal employees. Um, of course, the last, last year we actually got some help. A few years prior to that, we were really struggling for seasonal help. So... We really rely on seasonal help to get this work done. Um, basically, let's. 
The asphalt crew lays between about 3,500 to 4,000 tons of asphalt per year, and, uh, and a lot of that's done by hand. So um, we do have a paving machine, but as you can see in the picture, they're patching a, a trench right there. Um, we'll talk about what kind of things they do. Trench patches is probably the most common thing uh, that, that we do. Um, and a lot of it's because utility trenches, uh, a wa our water section might have a water leak and that they repair and they dig a trench in the road and our crews go back and fix it. Um, same with the sewer, the storm water and, and occasionally traffic, we, we do a few of them. Uh, they do do some contractor trenches if needed, if something happens for some reason and we can't find the contractor to fix it, we go out and fix it. Um, Gutter lines and strip paving, of course, anytime we do sidewalk, we're cutting into the asphalt. Um, so that's a picture of a, a new sidewalk that went in. Um, generally, we have to replace two to three feet in front of that sidewalk. Uh, after sidewalk support, our crews get in there about seven days afterwards to, to repair the asphalt and try and get it completed. Um, strip paves are basically larger. Uh, than gutter lines. It's just where we might have new sidewalk going in and we need to cut it wider uh, up to 8 to 10 feet. We need to use a paver so we, we just name them different things just so the crews kind of know what they're getting into. Um, and if it does sometimes require uh, base and recompacting there might be a road that maybe we're putting in some new sidewalk in the edge of the road didn't quite meet up or the crown of the road didn't fit so we'll have to cut that out. Yeah. It's just an identification kind of thing. Um, leveling and overlay. Uh, we've really gotten big into doing more leveling now. We've, we've got a large paver. Over the last couple of years we've been doing a lot more of that. Um, and, and let's go back to that picture just so you can see. So this road right here um, it's more than likely set for a slurry sill and we found okay that road probably has a drainage problem and so our crews will go in and they put a crown back in that road and uh, you can see that they don't go clear to the edge because we don't want to build up the edge for one but we want to build that crown up and we know within six months we're going to put a slurry sill over the top of that and so you won't even see the, the two different types of asphalt but uh, we call that leveling. Um, there's a lot of flat roads in Orem that need crowns, that have depressions and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, like repairing depressed areas. Usually done before slurry sill. Our crews are on a, a cycle. We have slurry sill on a si cycle that basically looks like a pinwheel where we do a certain subdivision. We impact about 80 to 90 roads slurry seal but prior to that our crews have to go in and make sure everything looks good and the depressions are filled in the bad spots are cut out um, all that kind of stuff and we we do look for temperatures 80 degrees and above to be able to do that um, remove and replace or is basically repairing them filled sections of road uh, they you might have heard the term alligator you know there's spots where it's just breaking up and we'll go out and cut them out um, we, it's kind of basically the same idea as a reconstruct. We don't call it that. We call it a remove and replace because it's a smaller area. Again, just to kind of identify that, usually around a thousand square feet. Um, sometimes we have to replace the base, just like a like a reconstruct. Um, if you want to think of it as just a small reconstruct, that's what it is. Uh, and then they do get into a few few reconstructs where we do them ourselves. Um, partial and full depth like Jet said. Uh, we don't generally get into too big of these with our own crews. We feel like contractors uh, should be doing the bigger work but we'll go out. We've done smaller subdivisions where it's a couple hundred feet, 300 feet long, uh, curb to curb. You know, this, this is not a picture of something we've done. I think Jet just found this picture, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> kind of gives you the idea. Um, and again, it's repairing large felled areas of road work. Uh, roadway larger than a thousand square feet uh, might need base recompaction sometimes we can get away with the base is good we just need to recompact sweeten it up a little bit 
Um, yeah. Pothole repair. Okay. Nobody's seen any of these in Orem, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jet, Jet confirmed this was not a picture in Orem, but we have looked this bad. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we have had some this year that um, have really kind of shown us some of the roads that we thought were were good um, that might not be. So uh, we don't like potholes. We just we just soon cut them out and repair them the right way. Um, but temperatures kind of stop us from doing that and like a winter like this like I said we just don't have the, the manpower to get out and cut everything um, so we look for different ways but in the winter uh, we, we try to use hot mix as much as we can we do have a plant in, in up in Salt Lake County that we can get hot mix through the winter if we need but generally in the in the winter we're using the cold mix and we call it UPM it's a temporary patch it's made to kind of go in potholes even with water um, yeah uh, I guess we can well, we for sake of time we might Second have to skip time. it okay. anyways KSL did a thing on our guys a couple of years ago um, I think this was in 2017 if I remember right we had another kind of wet winter which caused a lot of potholes and you know, it was in the media so they come out and wrote it on with us and um, yeah Okay, on the concrete crew, I'll just keep going. Okay. Um, again, we have full, four full-time guys, uh, crew leader, three operators, um, and initial two seasonals. Uh, they're, they're basically go out according to our inspections or call-ins and replace sidewalk, uh, install. That's what we call an ADA ramp right there with the yellow tile on it. Um, that's the corner I've been talking about. Um, they pour between 500 and 650 yards of concrete, which is actually quite a bit um, for such a small crew. And when you compare that with contractors, like uh, it, it's kind of funny. You get in that world, and they think, "Oh, you only pour that much." Well, we're also replacing. We're also pulling out everything that we have to pour back. So that's twice the work than just pouring. Um, so, anyways, I guess my point is, it's just a lot of work. And it's really technical work. So, uh, 671 yards this last year is probably one of our biggest years that we've had. So, these guys are awesome. All of our guys are awesome. Um, sidewalk replacement. Uh, basically, these guys are out replacing hazardous sidewalk, curb and gutter. Um, it's identified as, as the high or I think we've eliminated the extreme category now and just have high, but um, our crews up till this concrete project that uh, Jet was talking about, uh, most of that's been on our city crews over the years to, to get everything ready prior to that. And we, we're trying to figure out ways to do more so we can get them on in the subdivisions where we have a lot of uh, hazardous stuff for the, for the citizens that might not be getting an over the air service treatment. Basically, they just need to re remove it, improve, compact the base, and, and pour it back. Uh, a lot of drainage problems out there. Um, but most, mostly the things that they're working on is hazardous stuff. Uh, they get into doing some cross gutters, um, just dysfunctional cross gutters that needed uh, drainage problems, that kind of thing. Um, the ADA ramp replacement, um, like I said earlier, when we do overlays, they're required to go in. We like to put them in as much as we can. Uh, we have some uh, needs throughout the city that occasionally that we get uh, somebody needing some, some wheelchair ramps put in, and we'll get with them and try and find out, like say maybe somebody has a hard time getting to church um, we'll work with them and kind of identify routes and see if we can put them in for them. So. Um, yeah. they're, they're pretty technical things to put in and they, they're um, just to, to construct an ADA ramp, ADA ramp is pretty challenging especially when you're pulling, pulling out a corner that didn't meet prior so they take a little extra work. Cody mentioned earlier too that when improvements are done on a road, we're required 
if there if an ADA ramp isn't there, we're required to 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 put it in. Uh, we do a little bit of new installation, um, not a lot of it, uh, but they do get into that. It's generally done in areas where property has already been developed, has no sidewalk. Um, yeah, same kind of thing. Do a lot of miscellaneous con concrete work as well. Um, this is a picture of a pad at the city center where they have the diesel fuel paint um, sitting on it. They get into doing some of this. So we're doing there's some projects going on this year, such as some new restaurant uh, restrooms going on in, in Sharon and Geneva Park. That our crews will go in and, and pour the apron and sidewalk back around them, do things like that, just some special stuff. We do some work at some of the bigger projects, like we got the city center going on, Hillcrest Park. There's there's just different areas where they'll go do some different stuff. forgetting to hit the button. Um, Jet got into that trip hazard uh, mitigation project that we have a contractor doing, but we, we we do it ourselves as well. We have these milling machines to, to grind off the trip hazard as needed. Um, this program started back in the 90s and we actually was able to get through the whole city and mill everything with, mill, with our own in-house with guys like this. It took quite a few years to get done and uh, it's been really hard to find that extra help the last few years to uh, to continue with our program and that's kind of why we implemented having a company come out and do it and try and get us caught up um, but of course when it's when a resident calls in somebody stumbles or something like that they call in we get right out our first reaction is to go paint it just to make it obvious to everybody and then within we try to do it within that same week get somebody out there to mill it off take care of it and try to take care of several of them right there in the area where they're there. But eventually we're going to get through the whole city and try and keep it up again. And then we'll have to start over again. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's an ongoing thing. It's amazing how much sidewalk can move in one year. Um, a lot of it's due to trees. Uh, you know, uh, residents planting trees in their front yard and that kind of thing and it becomes challenging once some roots start to grow challenging so and in fact a lot of our uh, high rated sidewalk is due to trees trees is, trees are a big issue for us we don't like cutting them down but if we can get away with it but sometimes it's, we have to <clears throat> okay on to snow removal anybody got any questions so far or just keep going this might be the biggest one since we just got out of winter here <coughs> same guys that do the asphalt and concrete are the same guys that do snow removal and uh, in conjunction with our stormwater group. Um, again, we have we have about 12 personnel in streets and, and stormwater will have 12 personnel, so we got about 24 operators that do snow removal. Um, we have 15 trucks that we use, uh, 10 of, okay, I read that wrong, okay. Uh, Ten of them are the small, what we call main maintainer size. They're the the Ford 550s, the Dodge 550 size trucks. We have five currently. We have five dump trucks that are equipped. Um, an average winter, the city receives 35 to 40 inches of snowfall. Don't, don't know. What, don't we know, know what it was this year. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> a lot more than that this year. Um, we're separated basically into two teams. We have a primary response team. Uh, Jet calls it the A team. I don't know that I like the A team versus the B team. But I've heard Chris call it the A team. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a secondary response team. Basically, what that means is we have a group that's immediately ready um, to come out. Uh, they're they're hanging on to their phones, and then once they come out, that second team gets notified. And uh, if we need, to, if it looks like we're going to have to have another team come out, they're ready to go. So we just break them up into two groups like that. Um, they can be called in at any time, whether it's a weekend holiday or middle of the night. And we're going to get into some stats here in a minute of what happened this year. Um, and they'll stay out until the roads are safe. Generally, we keep them out at a maximum of 12 hours. Um, we don't like to keep them any more than that if they're behind the wheel. So. We don't like to even keep it at 12 hours, really, but sometimes we have to. 
Um, this is a map of what we call the big truck areas or quads. Um, each area is plowed by a 10 wheel dump truck for priority one roads and what we're talking about there is the red roads. We put our five big trucks, um, up to five big trucks on them, red streets right there. Um, and uh, occasionally they will get into the smaller roads if, after they get them complete. Uh, this is an, another map here of the small truck areas. So let me go back to this one real quick. You see that they're broken up into quads, so there's four areas. So each each truck's assigned an area, and I know I said we have five compared to four, but depending on how many trucks we have, we, we will break that up a little different. Um, in our small trucks, the, the colored areas is broken up a little bit more. We have one truck in each one of them areas. Um, they they uh, generally focus on if there's any red roads in there in their area they'll hit them but they generally focus on the blues which we call priority two uh, once them are all complete um, they'll move on to just the rest of the roads of priority three the the thing that kind of dictates the course is the, the traffic volume but also slope so a lot of them streets that are blue in there is, is what we've identified to have a steep slope so we try to hit them first Uh, here's some stats. So this was a crazy winter season. Let's look at these stats. Just, just put that up there. So uh, number of days impacted. Did you have the? I'll pull up the email. Okay. To have the uh, comparison. So this year, our crews, the way we track stats, I'll have to explain it a little bit. Um, our crews were dispatched on 50 days of, of this winter. If that makes sense. So 50, 50 times. That can be in after hours, that can be a regular work day, whatever. Um, each time a truck's activated, they have to fill out a report, we call that a record. Um, so they're turning in how many miles they drove, how much salt they used, all the, all them different kind of, kind of stuff on the report. Uh, we had 523 of them this year. So 12 guys a shift, 523 can kind of do the math. 39 of them 50 days was on a holiday. Uh, 391 of them, sorry, 39 of them records, right? Mm -hmm. 391 of them records was after hours this year. Um, total hours worked, 3,149 and a half hours. These are, these are a lot. Average response time, for our guys to get to work, it's been about 24 minutes. So, and they're coming from all parts of the county, in on bad roads. So they're they're responding pretty quick. Um, our total tons of salt used is 5,190. I'll get all these and then I'll go through. Uh, we do use uh, salt brine as well. We use 31,000 gallons of that. Um, again, the total lane miles in Orem is 550 plus, and the average miles driven per shift we figured was about 72. Total miles treated, 38,000 lane miles. So can I ask you, is this for the whole winter season or just January 1? This is from uh, the whole winter season. So this would be from October, <coughs> I don't know if we had storms in October, but or October till now. And to compare, um, last year, so I said 50 plus, 50 times this year, last year we had 14. Uh, number of records we had last year was 210. Total tons we used last year, um, I believe it was right at 2,000. We generally budget for 2,000 tons of salt. Uh, most years we don't use that. Last year I believe we used it up, but on average it's 2,000. Ever since I've been here it's been 2,000. Um, brine is a new stat that we, we just implemented. Brine a couple years ago we haven't really tracked the gallons and only half of our fleet is equipped right now with that. Um, I can get into what brine is if you want me to. I don't know. Do we have that on here? A little bit. A little bit. In the innovation. Um, but it's kind of a new technology. That's right. Um, uh, another stat that I have on here, just to 
to show you. We're putting down about 273 pounds of salt um, per lane mile. Our goal is 250 to 400. So we're, we're right on target there. Um, holidays, like again, we, we were out every holiday except for Christmas this year. And uh, normally we are out on Christmas. So that was a good change. I think that's about it there. Yeah, one more. We'll, we'll, what's that? Maybe I have one more idea. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I had that one there. Seventy-three. Okay. Number of records by day. This is kind of an inter interesting stat this year. We track like what days were affected, so you can see. And this is these records are basically when they're dispatched. They're all, the only way we can track is the day that they got dispatched out. It could be from. Um, 10 o'clock at night into the next day. So we don't record that as two days, it's just, <coughs> just the, the initial day, so. You guys it's, like to work early in the week, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, and, and what's funny is we they work- like their weekends. Yeah, Saturday is <laughs> yeah. unusual. Well, it is, right? And um, let's look back with that. So we work four tens Monday through Thursday, but weekends are, that's actually pretty heavy on weekends. Saturdays, it's interesting to see there's only one, but like I said, there's only one time that we were dis dispatched on Saturday. Most Fridays went into Saturday. Yeah. So I wish I had that way of tracking that <coughs> stuff. But, um, so weekends, really, you're, you're 100 and, what is that, 150 plus 70, 120. Four, five, 125 days, so almost the same as Monday, just for weekends. These guys had no weekends on their own this year. Um, our innovation, talk a little bit about what we have. We have, we do have a brine maker, a building out here in the corner that actually makes a salt brine. It's pictured in that top left corner, and then the top right corner up there is the storage tanks. Um, I think there's some text with it too. I keep forgetting to hit that. Uh, Got our salt building, salt dome out there that holds about 3,000 tons of salt. Our Santa racks there, the next picture, and then the bottom picture is not our truck, but it's it's a, a technology we're looking at getting into um, called anti-icing. Uh, it's basically spraying brine on the road prior to the storm. Um, through these slices, or the through the bullet points technology, ice slicer is what the red salt is. It comes out of Redmond, Utah. Um, it's mined salt. Uh, it works way better than the white salt out of the Great Salt Lake. It works because it's, um, oh, what am I trying to say? Uh, it, it's got a different, it's finer. Um, it's got different stuff in it than what we see in the Salt Lake. It's, it's basically sea salt. Um, it's the same stuff you've ever, you guys have seen the real salt in the bottle that you mm -hmm. use. It's the same same salt is what that is. Um, it just works at lower temperatures. It's it's a finer grade mix. It just I don't know. There's some science behind it. Um, we do use carbide or carbide plow blades. Um, they just last longer. We we recently in the last two years we put them on our smaller trucks. Um, we were changing blades, just regular steel blades, probably every two or three storms on a small truck. Uh, we put these carbide, carbide ones on and they're lasting the whole season, if not two or three seasons. So it's a, it's a big change. They are expensive, but they're well worth the cost. Um, we do have uh, the picture there on the, uh, of the Santa Racks and the detention pond. We want to bring up good housekeeping because it's really important that we cover our salt, that we protect it from the environment, that we, we have the detention pond in the picture there. So any runoff that comes off of that goes into this deep retention pond, right? It's a retention pond, right? right? Yeah. Not detention. So anyways, my bad. Uh, evaporation. <laughs> so we're. I guess the point is, is we're just we're trying to be in, environmentally friendly as well. Um, and then we'll just talk real quick about how citizens can help. Uh, we don't have a any code in form that says you can't park on the street, but if we can encourage citizens to not park on the street, it really helps us out. Traveling a safe distance, of course, around snow plows. Um, there's been some 
talk, I don't know where it's at, but there's been some talk this year about making it illegal to pass a snow plow. Uh, it's not a smart thing to do anyways, but um, be, be patient when you're out, when you're behind them. Uh, we have a big problem with people putting snow back out in the road. Um, Everybody is trying to help and likes to help and likes to snow blow their neighbors' driveways and sidewalks and plow them off. And if we could put that on the lawn, that would really help us out instead of putting it in the middle of the road. Um, and it, it kind of helps that people, uh, if they did, did that, they might not get so angry at us either when we put it back in the front of their house. That eternal yeah. struggle, I clear the walk, you yeah. guys drive by and put it back. Right. <laughs> um, a big big thing too is not letting kids play out, you know, when we build them big snow berms on the side of the road, don't let them play in them. There's, we're always, we, we kind of teach our guys to be aware of that, but one of our biggest fears is to have a child be in one of them when our plows come by. Um, just caution when driving in the, the weather, limit your travel, of course, uh, all these same things. Um, don't try to stop the snowmobile vehicle and then help your neighbors and keep obstructions such as portable basketball hoops out of them cul-de-sacs. You know, uh, we, we caught one with our plow a few years back, or our sander a few years back. Anyways, we thought that'd be a little funny, but just dragged it along with. It. <laughs> <laughs> he took it about a half a block before he even realized that, realized it was there. So. These are loud trucks. <laughs> and I think that's about it for that. So, any questions? I think there was a question earlier about sixteen hundred south. Or sixteen hundred north. Oh, yeah. sixteen hundred north. Yeah, that's sure. right. Sixteen hundred north. <laughs> yeah. So now, and I believe that's a state road. It not, is not it a is. city road, but uh, they transferred ownership over to it a couple years ago. Yeah. So. From state to Geneva, it's all not ours anymore. Okay. And that's the worst part of it. Yeah, <laughs> we'd they, love to do something. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you this: this year, that that is the worst I have ever seen that road. Just right, right now, it's like <clears throat> I'm glad I drive a jeep. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that uh, I got an email. I'm trying to remember where I saw it, but there, U UDOT is trying to get some emergency funding to put an overlay on that. So the reason it's been kind of on hold is it's supposed to get widened. Yeah. There's a plan to widen it, I believe, in 2030. Um, but they are trying to do an emergency overlay this year to <coughs> fix it, to temporarily fix it. So that's about all I really know. We've had our east side start to fall apart a little bit too. Not as bad as that. We're trying to keep up on that. But, um, we'll probably be doing some lane leveling on that street this year with our crews. So, so as a citizen, if I see a pothole or a sidewalk that's really bad, is there a specific number I'm supposed to call? Yeah. Or? Feel free to call the the help center, the three one one. We, we used to have an online map report, a pothole map that we took down because it was kind of getting archaic a little bit. And we found that the, if you just call 311, they get it to us. We get calls every single day on concrete. Um, our, our field site supervisor, Jet, and myself all go out to different ones and look at them. We do keep our sidewalks uh, and streets heavily inspected. We keep sidewalks within five years. So generally, if someone's calling about a trip hazard, we already know about it. It's just a matter of where it fits on our schedule and getting there. Um, if if somebody's tripping over it, we definitely want to know. We'll try and get out there quicker and at least mill it, do some temporary fix. But okay. yeah, we don't mind them calls. We take them every day. The hard part about it is having to tell them no, because some people think that uh, it's worse than what we rate it at. And you know, <laughs> if you've seen our list, um, we have we actually track call-ins in our list probably puts our crews back probably at least two years right now. That's how many calls we get. And so we're trying to find other solutions with that concrete, uh, that contracted project that we're doing right now to kind of kind of get caught up and do more, try and get our, get our crews more in the subdivisions and off that other stuff so we can help. But yeah. And if I may add one more thing, yeah. just in coordinating with 311, our uh, 
they've uh, specifically said the best place to go is go to the Orem website, click on contact, and report a problem. And that specifically takes that ticket and it gets sent to the proper person. So that's the easiest and quickest way to have that come through, either call in or use the report a problem tool on, uh, on the website. Okay. Well, I'll say as an Orem resident, thank you. I mean, this, you got limited resources, you got a limited crew, and you got a lot of, a lot of streets. A lot of sidewalks, a lot of issues, <clears throat> and so thank you for what you guys do. I'm sure appreciate it. Thank you. We'll pass that along for sure. I'm interested budget-wise. You say you buy 2,000 pounds of salt or 2,000 tons, 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 tons of salt. You used almost three times that this year. <laughs> Where'd the magic money come from? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I'm still trying to figure that out. No, okay. um, uh, we have. Well, it just comes from other materials. So right now, um, I say we budget for 2,000 ton. For example, this year, um, that's about $90,000, give or take, around. Uh, this year, because I had, a, had some money left over from last year that we didn't use, I had about $138,000 to, to put towards it. Um, with that bumping up, what we'll do is we'll probably just steal it from other materials. Uh, we do, maybe Reed and Tyler can speak a little bit, we, we do retain fund balance or what do you call that? Yeah, we always have reserves, reserves that we can dip money. into for these purposes. And yeah, that we can dip into. And Cody's been great to make sure that it's full at the, at the end of this, that he fills it by the end of the yeah. season uh, um, and when years aren't, when we don't need as much in those years. We can capitalize on that. We can we can keep PO open that was intended to purchase salt that year, but we didn't quite buy it all. The next year we can call on that PO, but we yeah. still haven't spent any of our current year money. So there's, there's ways that we can. Like I said, that that building, like Reed said, there, that building holds. We figure about three thousand ton. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, we're we're three thousand ton plus our two thousand that we can purchase. We're right at that five thousand, close to it right there. If our building's empty. Our building's about half full right now, and I, I would like yeah. to find a way to fill it up this year again. That kind of really saves us. So we still have salt in the back of that building that we put in there when we built this building. So we've been pretty good to, to manage it, keep it full. Um, yeah. I, I was going to ask you that, Cody. Do you make any attempt to kind of rotate the salt, to bring the old stuff up front, or? If, if we actually got way into the back, would you have to screen it or anything before you loaded the center, or does it stay separated I, pretty good? I think when we've got into that dryer stuff, it's been just fine. I don't, okay. I don't, haven't seen a problem with it. We don't rotate it. Um, this year we got back farther, I'd, I'd say, than we have in the past, and I didn't see any problem with it. So. it it's as old as the stuff that's still in the mine that they're going to Right, put right. <laughs> <laughs> And the stuff in the brine didn't expire, so. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the brine, the brine stuff that we're getting into is really going to be cost effective too. I, I didn't really go through that, um, but we can make salt brine pretty cheap. And what we do with that, if, if I can take a quick minute and just explain that, because it's really cool. Um, we have tanks, saddle tanks that are on the side of our sanders. And uh, what we call that is pre-wetting. And so as the salt falls through the sander and to the ground, we have spray nozzles that, that wet that with the brine. And so as it hits the ground, uh, there's a couple things that it, that it does. For one, it, it kind of clumps it a little bit better. So when it hits the ground, it's not scattering, bouncing to the, to the gutter. So it'll stay in place a little better. Plus what the salt have to do when it, when it is put on snow, it has to, it has to absorb moisture to be come a brine anyways to start melting everything and so when we spray that it immediately activates it so it's already activated before it hits the ground and it starts working immediately and so like that 35,000 gallons of brine that we we have two 10,000 gallon tanks I believe out there um, we we can fill them tanks up with less than one load of salt uh, we buy white salt for that to make the brine, but it's that cheap. We buy one load of salt, um, one dump truck load, and we can make, we might have to do that a couple times a year as we get into it and do more brine, but it, 
it's like cuts the cost of salt down by 30 percent you're talking two to three cents a gallon to make it's really really cheap stuff so uh, it's been used back east quite a bit they, they get into chemicals and stuff back there we haven't found a need for chemicals really out here but brine is brine is the way to go now it, it's really cool technology and it's going to it's going to move the needle for us for cost great I just want to second what Rob said. I, I see the crews and I think my neighbors and I, everybody's very impressed with the work you guys do both during the summer and winter and especially a challenging winter like this one and all those records that were generated. We recognize that uh, a lot of people are losing sleep while we're all going about our lives so we really appreciate it. You guys do a great job. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass that along. I like I'll, I'll second that. Uh, Paul third that. that. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. So. I, I do, I'm curious though. So. For instance, on these state roads, is there any way we can encourage work on those or getting those repaired? I mean, uh, he was talking you know, for yeah, the, the easiest way I've found is the, the state does have a click and fix app, um, <clears throat> and when I get calls, I'll go right to that app or website and I'll put it on there, and they seem to respond pretty good. Um, or just call their their office number. Uh, yeah, they're. I don't want to talk bad about the state, but I don't know that they're as reactive as we are. I wish they were. Um, what, what didn't make sense to me this last year was East Center Street. They reconstructed it from State Street to 1,000 East and didn't take it that last couple hundred yards. To oh, so that's, that's, that's a city road. <laughs> oh, is that? Yeah, okay. And there's a reason that we didn't is there's a stormwater line that has to be connected from about 1,000 East down the hill to the river. And so we back, we've got that on... List for, for next year to be overlaid uh, after just, the stormwater project. It's just happens. disintegrating. I yeah. know, I know. We're <laughs> going to get our crews out on that here shortly, too, and that hill that's going down is just falling apart, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's probably the biggest thing that holds us back sometimes from getting projects, just yeah, keeping, keeping in line with funding from everybody, and we have to work together with every utility and make sure that everybody's taking care of their stuff because we don't want to put down a road and then have a utility come through and have to do more work. So we're just trying to coordinate together and just work together in a fiscally, like I said, fiscally responsible manner. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes we have to make those calls. They'd really like to get moving in some areas, but with our uh, with our water uh, project, the tank project, and well, it's taking a lot more money than we were expecting with, the, with inflation. So yeah. water line projects that we wanted to do prior to overlay had to be postponed because we needed to make sure we could pay for the tank. So yeah, they're 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 itching to do it. We just told them, sorry, don't do it yet because <laughs> we don't want to do it and then go in and rip the road out because the residents will say, what in the heck are you doing? So yeah, we're very yeah. cognizant of that. <laughs> we hate when we overlay a road in the next, you know. Well, is, six isn't that the rule? You guys put in a new road, and then a utility comes <laughs> in the next one. That's, that's a big idea. You know? That seems to keep happening. You know? <laughs> we, we hate it. And, you know, and the, other, the other part to that is we, we, try, we don't like chancing it either. You know, if they, we go do an overlay on a road, we've had this happen where just the vibration of the rollers, the big rollers that get on it, will break a water line. And it's like something that... And then it just pops up, and we're out there repairing a brand new road. We hate that. So try to minimize it. Okay. Well, hey, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And, uh, thank you, guys. In case you didn't get the message uh, before, uh, we really appreciate the work that you guys do. Thank you. Um, Chris, do you have any other business? Uh, just uh, next month, maybe. I think we need to set a date for that. And as we approach summer months, uh, people are going to be going on vacations and camping and doing a variety of other things. So we may not meet as frequently during the summer, uh, but in terms of next month, I think if we're all on board, we could do that and then maybe have a pause for, for a couple of months as we uh, you know, entertain vacation ideas and things like that. So. Um, third week. In May 16th. May 16th. At 7, would that work? That work. Just make sure you set your alarm too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> 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 May 16th.
May 16th, did he say? Yep. Yep. Okay. I just want to echo too with the discrete section. They said you're an outstanding job in, in prepping the roads, getting in, coordinating with all of the other groups for the utilities. Uh, their snow plow uh, and ice control program is, is uh, among the best in the state. And so <clears throat> I realize they've gone, they've, they've made a lot of sacrifices this year. And, uh, we did have a nice luncheon with the city city council members uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're going to do a couple more in recognition of them. So um, I do appreciate that for myself personally and as our family. We we always know that the streets and orb are going to be cleared uh, reasonably quickly, you know. So um, and regarding uh, also regarding uh, 1600 North between State and the freeway, <clears throat> at least State until about well probably to the freeway, they are going to be. Uh, Overlaying that this spring, so they do have a product in place. I'd encourage you all to uh, take a drive by the tank project as well. Oh. The hole is done. They moved a lot of dirt in the past few months, and they'll start doing some doing some concrete work down there and start to build that thing up. It's still a couple years away from it being completely done, but that's kind of cool project to, to, to watch. If you go, make sure you can only travel west on 400 south, so approach from from the east at 400 west and 400 south, and you can drive and just uh, take a little peek over the edge, just drive by. It's an impressive project. Impressive hole. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, in that case, uh, I will... Uh, Consider a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, Second. Uh, all those uh, uh, in favor? All right. Okay. I'm not even going to ask if anybody opposes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please grab a treat or a drink before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Got about good work, 600 meters.